Welcome everybody, so good to have you here on this Labor Day weekend as we worship together as one church in three different locations across northeastern Pennsylvania. And let me give a big shout out to those of you who are joining us by video at our Wilkesbury campus and at our Clark Summit campus, and those of you perhaps who are watching online, wherever you may happen to be right now, I know that God is present with you, and my hope and my prayer is that God, by His Spirit, will speak to you in a very powerful, very personal way in these next few minutes that we spend together. Today we are wrapping up this series called Half Truths, and over the last four to five weeks we've been talking about these phrases that are so common in our culture, very well-known phrases that contain an element of truth but just aren't 100% accurate. These spiritual-sounding ideas that we hear and we repeat without really even giving it much thought. And throughout this series, we've been talking about the fact that a half-truth can be a really dangerous thing because it's got enough truth to make it sound believable, but it's also got enough error to really mess you up if you embrace it. And it doesn't take very much error to turn a truth into something less than truth, right? I mean, all you have to do is take a statement change it just a little bit, and it can send it off in a whole different direction. I was thinking about this uh, this past week because I came across some signs, and and I I thought signs, some of these signs that I'll show you are an interesting example of how you can take something true and make it kind of half true or even untrue, Like, like this sign that was in a parking lot. Violators will be towed and fined $50, which is a good thing because if you find $50, you can actually pay for the tow truck. You know, just leaving out that one E right in there, it just gives it a whole different meaning. Or this sign that's on a street just outside of Washington, D.C. Two-hour parking. You just have to squeeze the two hours into that one hour between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m., and I think they meant for that to be 7 a.m. Just, you know, one letter different makes all the difference in the world. And then there's this sign, which is on a bathroom mirror at a restaurant. It says employees must wash hands. And and those quotes, you know, they they really make a difference, don't they? It says employees must wash hands. Like, I would read that and I would think, you know what? I don't think I want to eat at this restaurant if the employees are just going to wash their hands, right? But uh, my favorite one is probably this one that somebody saw in a Home Depot store. It says restrooms with an arrow. You can do it, we can help. I I don't think so. Like all all it takes is a little bit, if you just change something just a little bit, something goes from being true to being, you know, not quite true. And so we've been talking about these statements, these cliches that, that even church people tend to hang on to and tend to believe that contain an element of truth, but there's just enough error in them that they can send you off in the totally wrong direction. So let me review a little bit about where we've been. In case you've missed any of these, you can go online and listen to these messages. Week number one, we talked about this half-truth. We have no right to judge. And the truth is we can't go through life without sometimes making judgments. We have to just do that, Jesus said, without being judgmental. And then week number two, we talked about this idea that God will never give you more than you can handle. And that's not true. But what is true is that whatever life gives you, God will help you handle it. And then week number three, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this half-truth, let your conscience be your guide. No, you can't do that because your conscience itself needs to be guided by absolute truth. And then last week, we talked about this half-truth, all you need is God, and, and it is true that we all need God, but that's not enough because if we don't walk together, we will fall apart like Dan White talked about last week. And today, We're going to finish up the series and we're going to talk about this idea right here that God helps those who help themselves. And as we talk about this half truth, let me, truth, let me encourage you to take out that connection card that you received when you came in. And there's a great place on there for you to take some notes. And let me just encourage you to be listening to one or two things that God really impresses on your heart. Write those things down, things that you want to remember, maybe even put into action this week. And as you're finding that, let me just give you one more reminder about this series that's beginning next week. It's called Insomnia 
We're going to be talking about some of those things that keep our minds turning and our stomachs churning, those things that so many people in our culture, culture uh, wrestle with. And uh, as we've been saying, this is a great opportunity to invite somebody to come to church with you during this series. So I hope you've been thinking about that and uh, thinking of somebody in your neighborhood and your family and your place of work that you'd like to give one of those invite cards to and invite them to be sitting next to you during this series. And we're going to make that easier for you. In fact, this past week, we mailed out postcards that look like this to 112,000 homes in our communities surrounding our campuses. And so on the back of the postcard here is uh, the listing of the topics in this series and where the three campuses are located and uh, the times of our services and a description of what the series is all about. And we did this because this will kind of amplify your own invitation. So when you invite somebody, chances are they will have already received one of these in the mail and that will just make it a little bit easier for you to invite your friends and neighbors and coworkers to be a part of this series. And I really appreciate a small group of, uh, of donors here at Parker Hill that uh, got together and made that possible. So that's coming up next week. Uh, looking forward to jumping into that series. It's gonna be really, really powerful, uh, I believe. But for today, we want, to, uh, we want to address this phrase right here. God helps those who help themselves. And it, you know, it sounds good, and it sounds right, and it even sounds like something that should be in the Bible. In fact, most Americans believe it is in the Bible. The Barna Research Group a couple of years ago did a survey, and in this survey, one of the things they discovered was this, that 80%, 81% of Americans believe that this is a direct quote from the Bible. Uh, when Jay Leno used to host The Tonight Show, he did this segment called Jaywalking, where he would actually go out on the streets with a microphone, and he would kind of ask people questions to see what they knew. And in one of these jaywalking segments, he was asking people if they could name any of the Ten Commandments. And time after time after time, people mentioned this as one of the Ten Commandments, God helps those who help themselves. But see, this did not come from the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It actually came from this guy, Benjamin Franklin. In 1736, he wrote that statement in an article that he penned for Poor Richard's Almanac. And it just kind of caught on, and it's been a part of our culture ever since then. But the bigger question is this. Even though this isn't in the Bible, is it true? Does it capture some kind of biblical principle? And my answer to that would be yes and no. It's a half-truth. There are some things about this statement that are true, but there are some things about this statement that are absolutely not true, and if we embrace them too tightly, they can really lead us off in the wrong direction. So let me start, let me start on the positive side and talk about one sense in which this very well-known statement is true. I, I think one good thing about this statement is, it, is that it can be a good reminder to us to take personal responsibility for our lives, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Let's suppose you're unemployed, okay, and, and you need a job, and so you decide that your approach to finding a job is you're going to pray really hard. And if all you do is pray, you're probably going to be unemployed for a very long time because you also need to put together a resume, submit some applications, go to job interviews, and things like that. Or let's suppose you're in high school and you have a big exam coming up, and your strategy for getting an A on that exam is, is to just pray really hard. Okay, so you pray, but, and praying is good. You need to pray. You probably ought to pray for wisdom and clarity and discipline. But then you got to put aside the cell phone, you know, crack the books and actually study because God kind of helps those who help themselves. Or, you know, suppose you need to lose weight or like me, you need to get your cholesterol down. Well, you could pray that God will lower your cholesterol and maybe he will do that. But along with praying, I think what you also need to do, which is really hard, is to watch your diet and exercise. And see, there's a sense in which this really is a true principle that God helps those who help themselves. In fact, in the Bible, uh, Paul, we know him as the Apostle Paul, was addressing a problem like this when he was writing a letter to the believers in the first century city of Thessalonica because there there were some Christians in this little group who felt like they really didn't have to work and they didn't really have to exert any effort that somehow God was going to take care of them. And so in the middle of this letter that Paul writes to them, he addresses this problem. And here's what he says in chapter three. He says, when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. 
We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. I love that little phrase. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. So what was Paul saying when he wrote this letter? He was saying, listen, you can't depend on God to provide what you need unless you are willing also to put in some effort. So there is a sense in which this statement is true. It's kind of like that, that old story about the guy who uh, was at home when, when a torrential rain started and the, the town that he lived in was near a river that began to rise and the town began to flood. And as the water was running down the street, his neighbor came by in a rowboat and he said, come on, get in, I'll get you out of here. And the guy in the house said, no thanks, God will take care of me. And it continued to rain and the water continued to rise and eventually he had to escape to the second floor of his home. And a National Guard boat came by to rescue him and And he said, no thanks, God is gonna take care of me. And it continued to rain and the water continued to rise and eventually he had to escape to the roof of his house and a Coast Guard helicopter came over and dropped a ladder down to him and he said, no thanks, I don't need your help because God will take care of me. And the water continued to rise and he was swept away and he drowned And then he stood before God, and with great disappointment, he said, God, I thought you were going to take care of me. I told everybody that you were going to save me, and you didn't come through for me. To which God said, I sent you a rowboat, and I sent you a motorboat, and I sent you a helicopter. What more did you expect? And the point is this, that God expects us to use what he's given to us. He's given us strength, and he's given us brains, and he's given us resources, And and we need to use those and let him empower what he's already given to us. And so there is a sense in which it's true that God helps those who help themselves. But here's the thing. There's also a real negative side to this phrase. If, if, If we understand it a certain way and apply it a certain way, it can really move us in the wrong direction. So let me, let me talk about the first negative side of this idea. See, we can use this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, as an excuse for our lack of compassion and generosity. Like sometimes God will bring people across our path who have legitimate needs and they're struggling to make it through life. And we might look at them and we might look at them and say to ourselves, you know what? God helps those who help themselves. And it becomes, you know, our way of kind of washing our hands of responsibility becomes our way of rationalizing our lack of compassion and our lack of generosity. But see, here's the truth. The truth is there are people who are doing the very best they can who just don't have the ability or don't have the resources that they need and God calls us to come alongside of them and to be his hands and feet. In fact, I think whenever we're confronted with the suffering and and the need that we see in this world around us, I think we need a different phrase. Rather than just saying God helps those who help themselves, I think we need to say this to ourselves. God calls us to help those who cannot help themselves. Because see, this actually is in the Bible. Like this is a theme that you see woven all throughout scripture that God calls us, if we are followers of Christ, to help those who cannot help themselves. In fact, let me just give you a brief tour of the Bible and point this theme out to you as it, as it kind of unfolds. If you start all the way back in the book of Leviticus, which is the third book of the Bible, if you start at the beginning, and this is just a listing of the laws that God gave to the people of Israel so that they would be his, his, his covenant community. And in chapter 23, there's this law. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And so God says to his people, listen, I don't want you to consume everything that you you grow. I don't want you to just keep everything for yourself. Just be a little sloppy. Just leave the edges for those who can't provide for themselves. Help those who cannot help themselves. And I've always thought that this was such a brilliant law because God commands his people to be compassionate and generous, and yet at the same time, it upholds the value of physical labor because the poor are required to work to do the harvesting that's needed. 
So that's Leviticus. You keep reading and you come to the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs is full of principles about our responsibility to help those around us who are less fortunate. But one of the most piercing uh, verses in Proverbs is in chapter 29 when it says this, the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. So just to make sure that we're understanding this, if you have no concern for the poor, that makes you what? That makes you wicked. Very, very strong words. You, you keep reading, and a few books of the Bible later, you come to a book of the Bible called Isaiah. I, Isaiah was a prophet. He spoke God's truth to God's people, and eventually his words were written down in, in, in what we know now as a book of the Bible. And Isaiah was speaking to God's people at a time when they, they, they felt like they were doing pretty well, like they were pretty flattered about how religious they were, and they, they talked a lot about how they prayed and how they fasted, and they, they really wanted God to notice. And, and Isaiah comes along, and he says, listen, do you want to know what real religion is in the eyes of God? And listen to what he says, Isaiah chapter 58. He says, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? He's speaking for God. This is God speaking to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood? And so God says to his people, listen, you want real religion? (laughs) I'll tell you what real religion is. Feed the hungry, clothe the poor, break the chains of injustice. That's the kind of worship God says, I'm looking for. So that's Isaiah. Then, then you come to Jeremiah. He's another prophet. And then the book after that is Ezekiel. And by the way, if you're having a baby boy, great name for a baby, Ezekiel right there, very tough name. And he'll be tough if you give him that name. But uh, e- Ezekiel, it, as he speaks to the people of Israel, there's this very interesting little part where he talks about the city of Sodom. And if you grew up in church, you probably know the story of the city of Sodom. Uh, The story is told in the book of Genesis, where where God destroys the city of Sodom. And uh, why did God do that? Why why did he see it as being necessary to destroy an entire city except for the righteous who lived there? And and if you grew up in church, you you say to yourself, well, it's because of a a sexual sin that was a a part of their culture. And, And there's some truth to that, But listen, listen to what Ezekiel says. He says, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. In other words, a a city nearby, a sister city. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. And so when, when Ezekiel talks about Sodom and why God's judgment was brought to that city, what is the first thing he talks about? They were unconcerned for the poor and the needy. Do you see a theme here throughout the Bible? And you keep reading and you come to the the New Testament, what we call the New Testament, and I won't even talk about the teachings of Jesus or what he modeled. I'll skip all the way almost to the end of the Bible. Here's what James, his brother, said. He said, religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. He says, listen, you wanna have a religion that's pure, a religion that's faultless, Here's what that looks like. You help those who cannot help themselves. You see, people who think they are followers of Christ and yet have no compassion for the needy and the forgotten of this world are missing a crucial element of the message of Scripture. And so when we confront problems around us, when we confront needs around us, instead of just saying, you know, God helps those who help themselves, we need to say this to ourselves. We need to say God calls us to help those who cannot help themselves. And by the way, before I move on, I I just want to say I am so encouraged by the way the people of Parker Hill and all three of our campuses responded to the opportunity in August to provide school supplies for needy families. And we're going to be um, finishing packing up those backpacks and delivering them this week. And then in two weeks, we'll give you uh, a report on that, an update on that. But let me just tell you, there was an incredible, incredible outpouring of generosity. And I believe we're going to see a ripple effect from that for years and years to come because you were so generous and you cared about the very thing that we're talking about here today. So let me tell you, as, as we 
kind of come in for a landing here in the last part of this message. The thing that I, I think I want to emphasize the most, though, is this negative of this particular phrase, God helps those who help, help themselves. I think the biggest negative of this phrase is the way that sometimes we understand it in relationship to how we relate to God. And, and what this can do if we really embrace this and internalize this is it has the potential of distorting the message of the gospel. And the word gospel just means good news. The gospel is the, the core message, the central message of Christianity. And here's what I mean by, by that distorting that message. Uh, according to the most recent surveys that I've seen, something around 82% of Americans believe that there is a heaven. Like eight out of 10 people believe that there's a heaven. And if, if you were to ask people, if you just go up to, to people on the street and ask them, okay, you believe in heaven, what do you think it, it takes to get to heaven? You know, the vast majority of people are going to say something like this. They're gonna say, good people, go to heaven. Uh, you have to be good, like, you know, like I'm good, I'm a good person, and God is going to see my goodness, and he's gonna respond to my goodness with goodness of his own, and he's going to make a place for me in eternity with him, because after all, God helps those who help themselves. Saw an example of this in an interview that was done in the New York Times with the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. And, and there were a couple of paragraphs in this interview when I read it that really caught my attention. Listen to this. When he sat down for the interview, it was a few days before his 50th college reunion. His mortality has started dawning on him at 72. But if he senses that he may not have as much time left as he would like, he has little doubt about what would await him at a judgment day. Pointing to his work on gun safety, obesity, and smoking cessation, he said with a grin, I'm telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Do you hear what he's saying? God helps those who help themselves. And see, what, what Michael Bloomberg believes and what he said in that interview and what the vast majority of Americans believe is actually quite the opposite of what the Bible actually says. Because what the Bible says about how to have a relationship with God, how to be reconciled with Him, how to spend eternity with Him is so much more beautiful, so much more profound, so much more compelling than God helps those who help themselves. In fact, let me tell you what it says. I'll begin here with Titus chapter three. This was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a young man named Titus. And he says this, he says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, that love appeared in Bethlehem in a manger with a baby. It appeared on a cross with a dying Savior. It says, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. In other words, we are saved Safe from death, safe from guilt, safe from our past, safe from a pointless existence. We're saved not because of all the good stuff we do, but simply because of what God has done for us. And then Ephesians chapter two, a letter written to believers in the city of Ephesus, where Paul writes this, he says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Saved from guilt, saved from your past, saved from death saved from a pointless existence. You've been saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by your works, so that no one can boast. And if there's one word, one word that captures the essence, the essence of the message of Christianity, it's this word right here, it's the word grace. That word is used over 200 times in the second part of the Bible that we call the New Testament. Grace is the foundation of what we believe. It is, it is the core of, of, of our faith. And if I could give you a technical kind of theological definition of grace, it is this, the unmerited favor of God, which simply means this. Grace is the undeserved gift of God's love and his forgiveness and his acceptance and our adoption into his family. And grace, by its very nature, is not something you deserve. It's not something you earn. It's not something you can bargain for. It's, it's not something you can work your way toward. Grace is purely a gift. 
that none of us deserve. In fact, I, I think the best way to really understand what the word grace means is to compare it with two other words, justice and mercy. Here's what justice is. Justice is getting what I deserve. Mercy, not getting what I deserve. Grace is different. Grace is getting something I don't deserve at all. Now, let me, let me illustrate how, how these three words work together in, in, a, in a way. This is kind of my favorite way of illustrating this. And uh, just help me out here on every campus. How many of you know what it is to overdraw a bank account? Like, not your own, but somebody else's. You've heard of people doing this where they overdraw a bank account. Okay. Um, I've actually done that from time to time. Uh, I, I sometimes get busy and, I, you know, I'm paying bills out of the checking account and my wife is writing checks and my, my kids are using my debit card to buy stuff online. And, and if I'm not paying attention, then th the account gets overdrawn. Uh, this happened to me a couple of months ago. And, you know, whenever I overdraw my bank account, my bank can respond to me in three different ways. They can demonstrate justice, they can show mercy, or they can give me grace. Let me tell you what that looks like, okay? So if my bank sends me a letter after I've overdrawn my account, this is what the letter would look like if it's justice. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. In accordance with bank regulations, we are charging your checking account a huge overdraft fee in spite of the fact that you don't even have any money in there. <laughs> that's justice, okay? Getting what I deserve, because that's part of the deal. You, over, you overdraw it, you get an overdraft charge, right? Okay, that's, that's justice. Mercy, however, would look like this. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. Since you are a valued customer, we have decided to waive the typical over, overdraft fee as long as you bring the balance into positive territory within the next 48 hours. So that, that's mercy. That's not giving me what I deserve, okay? Now, grace? <laughs> Grace is something else entirely. This is what it would look like if a bank showed grace. Your checking account currently shows a negative balance. Knowing how busy you are and how essential your ministry is to this community, we have decided to waive the typical overdraft fee. In addition, we have transferred $2,000 from the account of our bank president into your account just to make sure you have a healthy balance. Furthermore, we've assigned one of our employees to personally manage your finances so that you can focus on more important things. <laughs> That's grace. Something I need, but I could never, ever earn and never deserve. And see, here's the message. Here's the message of Scripture, what we call the gospel. Not that God helps those who help themselves. But God reached down, stepped down into human history and did for us what we could never do for ourselves. So let me tell you what the Bible really says. It doesn't say God helps those who help themselves. It says this, God helps those who know they can't help themselves. The gospel is the story of desperate people needing grace that was given to us by the only one who could give it. Now let me tell you what the biggest objection is. Whenever I talk about this, whenever people think about this, here's the biggest objection to the whole idea of God's freely given grace. People say, but Mark, you know, it's kind of dangerous to talk about God's grace and forgiveness because after all, doesn't it take away our motivation to be better people? And here's my answer to that. I believe that when grace is properly understood, it is a far greater motivation than fear ever could be. See, if you really understand grace, if you understand that your unpayable moral debt has been paid, if you understand that you have been set free, not because of anything that you've done, but because of what God has done for you, when you understand that, when that moves from your head into your heart, the rest of your life becomes one big, long thank you note and you begin to live up to your identity as a follower of Christ, not because you're trying to earn something or prove something, but simply because you've been given so much. I'll tell you what, grace is a powerful thing. See, this idea that God helps those who help themselves, that just creates pride. Yeah, God's gonna help me because I'm so good. Do you know what this creates? This creates humility and gratitude. And that ought to define us if we are followers of Christ. And let me get, uh, 
Let me just get very specific about what it means to embrace uh, this gift of grace because we've been talking for five weeks now about half-truths. And I, and I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes as we wrap up about the greatest truth that there ever has been in history. And that truth is this, that God so loved the world. He loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is grace. And let me tell you how you receive that grace, how you accept that invitation. Three simple words, A, B, C. You admit, you believe, and you commit. You admit the truth about yourself that you already know, that you're imperfect, that you fail, that you have overdrawn your moral and spiritual account with a perfect heavenly father more than once. And we admit that we just can't measure up. And then we believe, we believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he was and that his death and his resurrection created a cosmic exchange where we can trade in our guilt for his righteousness, our rags for his riches, our rejection for acceptance and standing in God's sight. We believe that and then we commit to that. And let me just put that all together for you in a very simple way prayer. And, and maybe if, if this is the first time the light is coming on for you, if this is the first time you're really understanding the true message of Scripture, it's not God helps those who help themselves, but it's God helps those who know they can't help themselves. And if you're understanding that for the first time, let me tell you what it looks like to admit and believe and commit. You just pray a prayer, not a formula, but something like this, Lord, I admit my need for forgiveness and grace. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you took the penalty of my sin on the cross. And today I commit my life to you as the forgiver of my sin and leader of my life. And I'm just gonna leave that up there on the screen for a moment. And let me say this, if you've never before made that kind of commitment, prayed a simple prayer like that, just in the quietness of this next moment, on your own, from the, from the fullness of your heart, with authenticity, Pray a prayer like that, and I believe that ushers you into a relationship with God. Just pray this, Lord, I admit my need for forgiveness and grace. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you took the penalty of my sin on the cross. And today I commit my life to you as the forgiver of my sin and the leader of my life. That is the greatest truth that you could ever embrace. Now, if this is confusing to you or if this is all new to you or if you just kind of made that commitment in your heart just now, let me tell you a great next step. We've got a class coming up in three weeks. It's called Starting Point. And Starting Point is an eight-week class. It happens on whatever campus you attend, 11, 15 Sunday mornings over eight weeks. And it's a great place for people who are just beginning their faith as a Christian or just coming back to church or, or still have doubts and still have questions. It's a great place to ask your questions and get some answers. So let me just encourage you, if you're new to this whole thing or just beginning, jump into starting point happening in three weeks on every campus. Now, we're going to wrap up today, wrap up this series and wrap up this service today on all of our campuses by celebrating a communion together. Communion is simply a reminder to us of where our hope is. Our hope is not in ourselves. It's not in any religious system. It's not in our best effort to be good people. Our hope is in a bloody cross and an empty tomb. And there are tables at the front and the back of the room on every campus, and on those tables are two symbols of our faith, profound symbols of our faith. The bread in the middle of the table represents the body of Christ, that baby in a manger, that man on a cross, that body that was broken out of love for you and I. And the juice in those bowls is a symbol, a powerful symbol, of his blood that stained the timbers of a Roman cross, symbols of grace, that wonderful gift that we've been given. And as we end today, the band is going to come back in just a few minutes, and as they they sing a final song, the ushers will dismiss you a row at a time. If you're toward the front, by way of the outside aisles, come to one of the front tables. If you're toward the back, go toward one of the back tables and just take a piece of bread and dip it in and hold it and taste it, and allow that to connect you to an event almost 2,000 years ago when grace was seen in a powerful way. If you're here today on every campus and you're a follower of Christ or you just made that commitment a few minutes ago, feel free to participate with us 
At the same time, if you just want to observe today, that's okay. Just let others pass by you. And as you come to the table, and as we celebrate and remember the cross together, just let this be for us a few moments of contemplation and celebration of amazing grace. Because here's what can happen so easily. God's amazing grace, when we first experience it over time, becomes intriguing grace. Then after a while, it's just interesting grace. And then eventually, it's just grace. And my hope and my prayer is that we would never cease to be amazed by grace.